morning. Good morning. It's our joy, as always, to share our shepherd with you, no matter who you may be. We welcome all of you who are in attendance. We welcome those who are streaming with us online. Uh, we'd love it if you'd let us know that you're there in the comments, and we welcome the visitors who are with us today. Um, if you are visiting with us, we humbly ask you to fill out a welcome card in the chairs in front of you uh, with some information you're comfortable with sharing. And um, we want to take the opportunity to say thank you for being with us today. You can place that in the offering plate as it passes by um, later on during the service. Now our service today, again, is, is kind of a, a special service. In the last couple of months here at Shepherd of the Lakes, we have been focusing on our Christian stewardship. Uh, that is focusing on, on being good stewards, good managers of all of the things that God has given to us. Um, that includes our, our time, that includes our talents, that includes the people in our lives. And as we most commonly think about it, it also has to do with our wealth, those kinds of physical blessings that God gives to us. Um, and so as we enter our final month of our stewardship challenge, challenging ourselves, having God's word uh, challenge us in the way that we steward, um, that is what we're going to be focusing on today um, as we focus on living a life lived shrewdly. We'll talk more about that in the service for today. Um, our service is printed out for you um, in your service folder. We'll be following along with a special service in here. We'll have everything displayed for you on the screens. Um, this morning we'll, we'll begin with our, with our opening and our um, responsive confession and absolution. Uh, I invite the congregation to please stand. And may the Lord bless, bless your, your worship, worship this, this morning. morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, every good and perfect gift comes from you, including the physical gifts you pour out into our lives. You intend these treasures to be used for your glory and in service to our neighbors. We repent for being selfish in the use of the treasures you have given. Forgive us and let your peace rule our lives.
by your grace and mercy. Help us to imitate the example of your Son and of our brothers and sisters who have gone before in humble and willing service to you, full of faith, hope, and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. turn our attention to God's word selected for today, beginning with a reading from 2 Kings chapter 4. A godly woman uses her resources for what really matters. She wasn't giving to get, but she was giving to support. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. One day when Elisha came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to his servant Gehazi, call the Shunammite. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her, Elisha asked. Gehazi said she has no son and her husband is old. And Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel. Let us acclaim our gospel this morning with our um, verse of the day and its spoken response. Alleluia. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. Alleluia. Rejoice in the Lord for his love and faithfulness. Our gospel for today is taken from Luke chapter 16. These words will serve as our sermon text for today. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich, young ma- a rich man whose manager was, was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will, give you, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, 
or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, who loved money, heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. At this time, we'll join in singing our hymn, What is the World to Me? Um, today, we will refrain from having a children's message, so we will sing the whole hymn, What is the World to Me? Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's okay, you can be honest with me. Were you dreading today? We've been spending the last three months talking about stewardship. We've been looking at the different angles of stewardship. We've been looking at lives lived as his disciples, cherishing his word. We've been looking at a life lived for others as we, we deal with those that God has put into our lives. We've dealt with living lives of hospitality. But now we get to the one thing that everyone really thinks of when we think of stewardship. Money. 
Now, we wouldn't be doing ourselves and God's word of justice to claim that, that what we're doing today is just talking about money. Really, we're talking about our attitude when it comes to money. Wealth, riches, money, they are all tools. There are tools for us to use. They are a means for us to serve. And the way we use it tells us a lot about our attitude towards it. It's a good indication of whom we are serving. And that's the question for us today. As we go through the words of our Savior today, we are going to be asked this question. We are going to ask ourselves this question. Whom will you serve? Will you serve the things entrusted to you, or will you serve the one who entrusts these things to you? Which master is the one who has truly given you purpose? This evaluation of our attitudes comes during the last year of Jesus' life. Uh, He's spending time with his disciples, teaching them um, about what life will be like for his people after his death, resurrection, and ascension. And so these words are meant to be a teaching about how a a Christian thinks about money. And as he so often does to teach, Jesus uses a parable. And now as we get into this parable, it's important for us to understand that the lesson we are being taught is not to emulate the whole character of the individual we have in this reading, but to focus on a specific aspect, a specific characteristic of this individual. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions, so he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Jesus explains that there was a manager, a steward, who was being accused of being bad at his job. He had mismanaged the wealth of his master and was going to be fired for it. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. He really didn't have any other options after this. He couldn't uh, do the physical labor necessary for, for physical work. Uh, he was too proud to beg. And he recognizes that in this situation, the solution to his problem has to come outside of himself. He can't solve this problem himself. So he comes up with a plan. He plans for his future. He makes shrewd use of the things that had been entrusted to him. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. So in order to make friends for himself, to make people um, happy with him, and to have a future for himself, he significantly lowers the debts of those indebted to his master. And here's where the most surprising part of this parable comes in. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. We couldn't imagine the master acting this way, but the servant did. He knew his master would deal mercifully with him and planned accordingly. He was commended for the way that he had acted shrewdly. Jesus uses this passage to teach and warn about the love of money. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. 
Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus makes it clear to his people that wealth is a gift of God. He gives it to his people to manage it for him. And the way that God's people manage their wealth and money says a lot about what is going on in their hearts and in all the other aspects of their life. If their attitude of money is in the right place and they're serving the right master, they'll manage that money correctly. But if they have the wrong attitude or the wrong master, then they will inevitably mismanage their wealth, the gifts that have been entrusted to them. And Jesus points out who those two masters are. First, of course, is God. And the other one listed here for us is money. Actually, very literally, the word there is mammon. Maybe you've heard that word before. Um, It comes from the same Hebrew word that we get the word amen from. Really, mammon is just a word that means the thing that we put our trust in. And this, this word, this term, is used to personify material wealth, physical riches. So you can have two masters. The one who gives the wealth or wealth itself. Now, as Jesus had been teaching about this, there were others who had been listening in, the Pharisees, the spiritual leaders of the day, and they did not appreciate what Jesus had to say about this. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. But in response to their reaction, Jesus says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. They thought that their wealth made them valuable in God's sight. They thought that because things were going well for them physically meant everything was good with them in God spiritually. But they had the wrong attitude, a sinful attitude about their wealth. They were more devoted to their wealth than to God and were very upset when they were being indirectly called out for their sin. Now, it's not an an uncommon thing to be uncomfortable when the topic of of wealth and and money gets brought up. And we've heard and we we understand the the, the different warnings that there are about about money and wealth. And yet still we, we can get a little sensitive about hearing about how we should be using our wealth. Um, We can even maybe get a little bit defensive when we start hearing people talk about how we should use our wealth, the things that, that I have earned for myself, the things we work really, really hard to achieve for ourselves. But we can't forget that important fact that our wealth is not our own. Our riches, our our blessings, our income, all of that is a gift. There's something that God has given to us as the one who is the, the creator and preserver of all things. All things belong to him. And what he does is he entrusts his wealth to us to manage and use wisely and properly. And yet, how easy it is for us to turn the things God has entrusted to us into the things we trust the most. We start to build our identity around our wealth, around those things we've been given, instead of the one who has given them to us. And our service changes from serving a God who's created us to serving another thing He's created for us. And if that's the approach we're taking, if that's the attitude we have toward our wealth, then we will inevitably end up mismanaging the things that God has entrusted to us. When mammon is our master, we misuse and abuse the things that God has given for good. 
This attitude, this mismanagement is an indication that there is something wrong with our attitudes and our hearts. And if we're incapable of handling these physical blessings, why should we be trusted with spiritual ones? If we cannot handle things that that are not our own, why should we be given things that are our own in eternity? The answer is we shouldn't. We don't deserve these things that our God has given to us. So what does that make us think about making mammon our master? Something that God views as detestable. What should a proper attitude be toward the riches that God does give? Well, it would be appropriate to first consider the greater blessings that your God has poured out on you. We take a look at the one who spoke these words, our Savior Jesus. You take a look at the way that he conducted himself, the way he carried himself throughout life. You could make a a very easy assessment of that. You can look at Christ and see the perfect steward. The one who managed his time and resources perfectly, not just for himself, but for the sake of other people. The one who spent his time and his energy and his resources reaching out to others to proclaim that gospel to them. You look at the one who spent his time living a life in our place perfectly so that we would not have to. We look at him who gave up all of his riches, the riches and joys and pleasures of heaven, to come down into this sin-filled world to save sinners. We look at him who gave the greatest cost to save us, who shed his precious blood, blood that had infinite value to buy us back, to make us his own, who made that perfect payment for sin once and for all. It is in His work, His saving work, that He gives us a a brand new identity. One that is in Him through faith. One that is as a child of God. One who is dearly loved. One who has the certainty of eternal life. And it's because of Christ That even though time and time again we find ourselves failing to to properly manage the thing God gives us, God doesn't fire you. He doesn't do away with you. Instead, still in His grace, He continues to entrust His blessings to you. He entrusts all of this to you so that you can serve Him. All of these blessings that are over and above the forgiveness that you have, the salvation and the eternal life he's already given. That's the kind of master we want to serve. That's the kind of master you get to serve through faith in Christ. And it is this very master who's entrusted all of these wonderful things to you also gives you a special purpose and role in the way that you use them. You think about financial planning and oftentimes the the best advice that can be given to you is plan ahead, right? Plan for the future and that's that's what we do. We make sure that that we're set up for retirement. We make sure that our our families are are provided and taken care of. Um, We make sure that that there are are gifts um, able to be given um, when that time should come. And that's exactly the kind of advice that our Savior gives us in His words. But actually, He wants us to plan even further ahead than that. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The wealth that we have isn't just to to set ourselves up for life. 
we get to use the blessings God has given us to set up others for eternal life. Now, we understand fully that, that our money does not save us. We cannot buy our way into heaven. We can't take those things with us. But yet, we understand from these words at the same time, we can use our wealth to help others come to salvation. You saw in our parable that, that this, this manager used, his, used that wealth to make friends for himself, and that's exactly what Christ calls his people to do. To make friends. To, to bring people into, you, into the family. To make use of this so that when the time comes, you'll be welcomed by those very same people in heaven into eternal life. So we look at what we have. We look at these words of Scripture. And as, just as we've been doing these last couple of months, we look at this and we say, we're going to challenge ourselves. We're going to, uh, to challenge ourselves to, to plan for the future, not just our future, but for the future of God's kingdom. To challenge ourselves and look at all of the incredible blessings that God has given to us and say, what kind of gifts do I have? Do I have gifts that, that can support the church that I attend? Do I have gifts that can be given to, to support a, a special ministry in our nation or, or throughout the world? Do I have the means in which that I can, that I can use this um, um, to form a relationship with other people so that I can bring them an even greater gift? That is the gospel. And it's okay to challenge ourselves to do this. We're, we're we're able to challenge ourselves to do this because ultimately in Christ we have freedom. We have freedom from our wealth that it is not our end all be all. We're freed from, from the pursuit of that and in order to see that it is, it is a means for us to use for the sake of others. And we're able to challenge ourselves in this regard also because we're freed from the worry of our wealth, from the worry of being provided for. Because the one who has called you to this purpose is the very one who's going to make sure that you're taken care of. Going through this text, I, I'm reminded of, of uh, a really great passage from the book of Malachi, book of, uh, from Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. Where the Lord says to his people as he's encouraging them to give, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. We can challenge ourselves because God has put himself to the challenge. To make sure that, that we are taken care of, that, that our needs are met, and that we can carry out his purpose for us in order to make friends for us. And you can think about the kind of result that has when God uses us to make friends, when God uses us and, and the tools we have to bring people to saving faith. You think about that welcoming on the last day when we are welcomed home by even people we never even met. Who say to us, it's because of your giving that the gospel was able to reach. It's because of your, your support of, of ministry that I was able to, to hear the gospel for the first time and know about what Jesus has done for us. What that welcome will be like to join those people together with the Lord who in his grace has done all things so that we could stand there with him in the greatest riches possible that paradise that knows no end. This is the kind of God we get to serve. One not only who has entrusted us with things, but who has also given us a purpose to use those wonderful blessings he has given to us. And so when we come to God's word and hear this, we don't have to dread 
talking about our wealth, talking about our money. We don't have to dread talking about our, our attitude towards them. Because we look at all of it as, as a wonderful gift. God in his grace has entrusted us with, with our wealth, with all of these things. He's given it as, as another outpouring of his grace through his son, Jesus. And he says, and you get to go and use that. You get to go and use that for the sake of others. So that others can be brought to that same saving truth. So that they can have the same blessings spiritually that you do. This is the God we want to serve. This is the God we are happy to serve. This is the one we get to serve shrewdly. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Let us continue now in confessing the true Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join now in the response of prayer of the church. Almighty Father, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. You give us time, energy, talents, and treasures. Because of you, we can say with the psalmist, the mountain and lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Your word teaches us of your great love for us and how to love our neighbor. Give us wisdom in using your gifts in God-pleasing ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us that what people highly value is detestable in God's sight. Help us to recognize our true treasure in you, our God, our Savior, and our God. Protect us from the devil who would have us marvel at insignificant things as a treasure, while neglecting the great gifts you give us in your word and sacraments. Give us wisdom in cherishing you and your greater gifts in God-pleasing ways. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you have set us apart and made our bodies your temple. You live in us. Your word teaches us who we really are by the grace of God and through the innocent suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give us wisdom to see that godliness with contentment is great gain, and grow in us the fruit that is pleasing to you, Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Accept our prayers for the sake of Jesus, our Savior. Help us to not be arrogant, nor put our hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. But help us put our hope in you, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. For Jesus, our Savior's sake. Amen. We join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. At this time we'll gather our faith offerings to the Lord.
It is at this time during the service that we do things a little bit differently than normal because of this special service. We're going to continue now um, with a short Bible study based upon what would have been the second reading for today, taken from 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, this morning, uh, to get us started, I will go ahead and read uh, this reading for you all. And as I read that, um, I would ask either the usher or the elder if they could go and get pens uh, to distribute. Um, for the people, if you would like to take notes um, as we go through our um, study for today. Um, note this is a 19-minute Bible study, so we'll be keeping an eye on the clock and trying to, to, to gently keep us moving and all the while being fair in the way that, that we go through the material for today. Um, so please listen as I read through 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this. And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made, good your, you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Jesus Christ, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The word of our Lord. Here today we have a, a section from the book of 1 Timothy, which is a letter from Paul to a young pastor named Timothy, um, encouraging him on, on dealing with wealth in his congregation. Um, we'll look at that first introductory thought there at the bottom of the page. The Apostle Paul says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. The writer of Proverbs 30, verses 8 to 9, prays, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? 
or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. You look at that passage from Proverbs, um, how is this a great example of godliness with contentment, and how does it serve as the test to see if we have godliness with contentment? Ultimately, in the pursuit of wealth, if we are focusing too much on our pursuit, as, as the writer of that proverb says, what might that ultimately bring us to? Okay, there's a wandering from the faith. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a danger, danger for us, too, right? right? Um, um, and before we get there, right, um, uh, as the, the writer of the Proverbs in that, in that question says, right, um, if we're continuing in our, in our pursuit for wealth, what will we use ultimately to get it? We'll do anything and everything, won't we? Including falsehood and lies. That's why the writer prays, keep me from falsehood and lies. I keep them far from me. Um, note the, the content of that prayer. How is that a good summary of contentment? Note what he's praying for in that proverb. Not having too much. Not having too much and not having too little, but he wants his daily bread. Right now, think catechism. When we talk that petition and the catechism, what do we mean by daily bread? Yeah, what, what, what we base our, our basic needs, right? Like our basic daily needs, right? He asked ask for that. Um, it brings up a really good point. Um, raise your hand if you've ever prayed for God to give you less. <laughs> right? Because what, what, is, what is the thought in the writer for the proverb in, in saying that? Why would he pray for less? What's that? Less distractions, right? Um, what does he say? Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Look at what I have. Look at what I have accomplished. Look what I have gained for myself. Look how great this stuff is. Who needs a God when you are set with what you've got, right? So there's that warning on, on either side of it, right? Um, I don't want too much, otherwise my heart will turn away. I don't want too less, so that uh, my heart falls into sin in, in, in that regard as well. Um, looking for that contentment. All right, so now let's go get into the, the text of Timothy properly. Um, looking at the, into the text section that starts on the top of the next page. Verse 10, uh, verse 10 of our reading, the, the last part of the very first paragraph, um, is one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Many say money is the root of all kinds of evil instead of the love of money. Prove that money itself is not evil. If money were evil, we probably wouldn't take a lot from you. Yeah, right? Okay, that, that's a good one, right? Would we be asking people for money at church if money itself were evil? That's a good point. Yeah, we use that to help other people as well, right? Uh, we use it to, 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 for those who have less, we're able to use it to help and, and support them. Um, do, a, do a quick think, thinking back and remember some of the, the prominent people in the Old Testament. What do they have a lot of? Had a lot of money, right? Maybe, you know, Abraham, um, the guy who was rich enough to have his own army and go save his cousin from other people, right? Uh, the man who had uh, wealth upon wealth upon wealth, all of that was a blessing from his God. Um, same thing with, with his son and his grandson. Same thing with King David, who we've been talking about in our Bible study. Uh, all of them had wealth and was, those were, were blessings, right? What is the problem? What really is the problem with money, not money itself? Love. Right? The love, right? What's going on in here and how we think about it, right? The problem is not money, but with the heart towards money. Um, I 
That's why those without money can have money problems too. It's, it's the desire for it, right? I'm wanting more and more and more. Number two. In verse 11, Paul tells Timothy to flee from all this, that is the love of money, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. How does each help a person flee from all of this and acquire contentment? Maybe we'll get things started this way. Ultimately, when we want to pursue these things, where do we go? What's that? Prayer. Prayer is certainly right. So when we ask for these things, where do we find them? In the Word, right? Um, right, because what happens when we go to the Word? God works through that, doesn't He? That is one of His means of grace. Uh, the Holy Spirit works through that to, to build those things up in us. Um, and so as, as that is working more in us, what are we uh, less likely than to pursue? Right, yeah, the wrong stuff. Right? That we're not focusing on, on the wealth here. No, I'm focusing on, on the, the things that I am called to do. Um, knowing all the while that it is the Lord who provides those things for me. Um, so that, that in, in looking at righteousness and living rightly before God, I'm not worried about that. Um, living a life of faith, fully trusting in God, not in anything material. Loving God above all things. Um, enduring even when there may be troubles or hardships. Yeah, I can hold fast because I know who my God is. Um, and gentleness, um, not getting upset and, and dealing with people in, in improper ways because of this. Um, we focus on Him, uh, our love for Him, and our love for others. Number three. Uh, in verse 13 and following, Paul alludes to Jesus' second coming. Uh, in what ways is this motivation to flee from all of this? Things are way better in <laughs> Certainly, yeah, that better stuff is, is that the stuff that is coming with him is far better, right? Um, what's the what's the, the often uh, expression used? You can't take it with you. Right? Um, we're not going to bring that with us. Like, Bobby, like you said, there's better stuff that God's in store for us rather than just this, this monetary stuff. Um, but also, not, not that we're, we're scared of that judgment, but also when he comes again, what are we going to do when we stand before him? We're going to be judged, right? We're going to have to give an account of what? What we've done and how we have managed the things that he has given to us. Um, and in recognition of what our, our verdict is going to be, we know that in Christ that uh, we have, we are innocent. We want to um, be able to say, yes, I was, I was faithful with the things that you have given to me. Um, we've got better things to look forward to. Number four. In verses 17 to 19, Paul lists two dangers when God blesses someone with wealth and then describes the best way to use your wealth. Identify the two dangers and how one should use their wealth. What, let's start with the two dangers. What are the two dangers Paul lists in that last paragraph of our, of our reading? Arrogance. arrogance, right? What would that arrogance be in? Because I'm, I'm blessed in such a way, that must mean I'm what than other people? better, right? God loves me more. I'm more important than other people because of what I have. What's the other one? Hope, right? Um, in, in, in what way are we tempted to put hope and trust in wealth? Yeah, right? Um, how am I going to get out of this situation? Just spend it, right? Um, how am I going to, to get through uh, this moment in my life? Well, if I buy enough stuff for me, if I have enough, uh, that is the thing that is going to help me. Um, yeah, it's easy to put trust in riches instead of the one who gave them to you. 
Um, would we be more content as people if we had $10,000 in our checking account or zero? Ultimately, in Christ, do either of those numbers matter? Right? It doesn't matter, uh, but think of why we want to save more and more. It's not, not what, but the why. Um, anything else on the Into the Scripture section? Please. So having too much money can lead us into spiritual danger. Mm -hmm. Not having enough, be, but being wise with our money keeps us from possibly breaking the law if we don't have enough just to get what we need. So there's there's two things. There's a love of money and having too much and being left away from the spirit. But there's also not having enough, not being wise enough with what you bring in and living within your needs is also a principle of our faith so that we don't get tempted into a situation that we will excuse just being Right, and that's the we um, you right, we're right where that father brought that up in our introduction, right? Yeah, what's what's the, the sin on the other side of the road, the other gutter that we can fall into, right? Um, and as well, in my pursuit, I don't think that I have enough. So what is that going to lead me to do? Uh, it's going to lead me into other areas that that are that are dangerous and and sinful. All right, let's let's finish up with the applying it section there. Um, for what reasons can a person who loves money not be content? Never enough, right? Um, yeah, never, yeah, can never ever be enough. You will always want more. Uh, there's a, a, a phrase here in, in the notes, right? Idols are insatiable. Whatever it may be, it's never enough. We always need more of that thing, whether it's money, whether it's whether it's food, whether it is alcohol, whether it is any of those things, it's never enough because they, those things can never truly satisfy what we really need. Um, only God, God is the only one who can do that. Uh, final point number two, Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Um, explain the truth of Jesus' words when it comes to our spending priorities like gifts to the Lord, paying taxes, providing for family and the poor, etc.
Um, God's word has challenged me this way. What are ways in which I can meet that challenge? What are ways I can challenge myself in the coming days, weeks, months um, in, in carrying out this aspect of my stewardship? Um, that box will be there um, at the entrance to the sanctuary for you to put in. You've got time today to put that in. You also have next Sunday uh, to put those things in the box. So please do take time as I walk back up to the altar the rest of the day. Um, consider that. Uh, meditate on that. Go back to God's Word. Read it again. Um, think about ways that, that we are able, we have to, but we get to um, serve our God in. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Will you uh, sing our closing hymn forth in your name, O Lord, I go. Once again, good morning to all. Thank you for being with us today. Um, just a, a couple of announcements there. Um, if you look at the back of your folder, you see um, all of them, including all the special events that are coming up, the special services that are coming up. Um, please note, uh, the blood drive is coming up this Friday. Um, we're looking for some people to help sign up. If you've got any questions or are interested in helping, um, you can uh, talk to Joan um, about helping out with, with the blood drive. Um, there's also a sign-up sheet on the table next to the office um, for our Thanksgiving
Thanksgiving potluck, which is going to be following the service next week, Sunday. Um, we've got a couple people sign up bringing some things. Um, we hope all of you are able to attend it. It's a, a way that all of us as, uh, as a family of believers can come and give thanks together um, um, for the, uh, the grace that we have in the Word and for the fellowship that we share with each other. Um, there's a sign up for, for how many uh, people are coming as well as um, anything you, you'd like to bring as well. Um, that'll give people a good idea of, of how much to prepare um, when they're preparing things for thanks uh, for that meal. Um, other than that, um, a reminder then, with um, Thanksgiving coming up too, we'll have our Thanksgiving service the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. Uh, that's listed there for you, as well as our special um, Advent service, which is going to be the week after that. Um, I'm going to make one note um, that I'm going to be changing the date uh, of the uh, mini workshop number four when we round out the month and finish up talking about this aspect of stewardship. We're going to bump that a week earlier to um, uh, the 8th during our normal Bible study time. Um, which brings me to another point. Um, there will not be Bible study next week. We'll allow time for setup uh, for the, the Thanksgiving potluck following the service. Um, and then one other thing that's not mentioned in your folders, um, many of you probably have already noticed all of the work that is being done um, next door, um, both here um, and over on, on Lobdell. Um, there is a, a subdivision being put in, about 95 homes are going to be put in right next door to us. Um, and we're already looking into ways that, that we can, um, as stewards, show our hospitality to those who are moving into the area um, we're looking forward to, to putting together um, some welcome baskets, baskets with some cleaning supplies and some church information to hand out to people who are moving in. Um, um, we know that um, whenever a house is being built, someone has already purchased it and is already planning to move in, so that can help us kind of keep pace with people who are moving in. Um, what we would ask of the congregation is if you guys would be willing to donate some of the cleaning supplies so that we could fill those baskets. Um, we're looking for like cleaning solutions, um, wipes, and paper towels. Those would be good, some good things. And maybe also like cleaning buckets to put, make, be the, the carrying vessel for everything um, so that we can drop those off, uh, welcome them as, as literally our neighbors uh, to the area and get a chance to hopefully then be able to share our shepherd with them and be able to proclaim the gospel with them. There'll be more information coming about that in a place where you can drop all of those things off. Just wanted to put that on your radar today. Um, if you did take a pen, uh, um, the usher will, he's got a basket for you. You can plop those pens back in. Um, we'll have the, the box out so that you can put your commitment cards in. Um, if you're looking for other ideas, again, remember, you can head to our website. There's a document there with a whole list of other options that you could do um, for, for writing out your challenge for this month. Um, it's a big help for us as, your, uh, as the elders to help how we can best help you um, uh, in living your, your Christian vocations. Uh, those are all of my announcements for today. I uh, invite you to join us some, for some refreshment and fellowship following the service. I want to pray for God's blessings on your coming day. May he be with you until we see each other again.